The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to discuss common garden myths so you don't have to keep doing them because they don't work, as well as preserving your harvest without canning it. Our guest is YouTuber Jessica McCollin will be with us, and we'll answer your garden questions. The hour is full, so join us. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. And welcome to another edition of the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Happy that you've allowed us or allowing us to be part of your day. I'm your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, preserving your harvest, as well as uh, canning what you grow. Happy you're tuning in, whether you're tuning in one of the 18 AM and FM frequencies broadcasting our program here in 2024 through a radio app, through our parent website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Underneath the Season 8 tab, the top of the page, podcast replay, in-studio video replay on YouTube, however you're doing such. Thank you so much. You want to be part of the program, you can do that by simply sending us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Uh, let, we'll answer your question. Let us know where you're listening from, as well as you can give us a call toll-free, coast-to-coast at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. Six nine. Well, Holly, before we get in the program, it's time for uh, the joke of the week. Yeah. So, why didn't anyone laugh at the gardener's jokes? I remember, too too sour. Too I don't too know. corny. They were too corny. Corny play on words. Yeah. Corn. All right. This week's garden joke is brought to you by Rescue dot com. American made rescue products keep your family, home, and yard protected from pests, insects like wasps, hornets, yellow jackets flies ants and more learn more at rescue.com that's r-e-s-c-u-e dot com so garden mess uh we like to uh inform you of these particular activities in which some people choose to do for a variety of reasons some people swear that uh they work perfectly and there's no reason why science should disprove them however science in this instance uh, as well as university extension offices and universities whom do this for a living have disproven these particular activities to be functional or productive. So we're going to go over several of them, and you may be doing them, and you may have done them for years, but you don't have to do them anymore because they don't work, regardless of what kind of results you're seeing. Yeah, so the first one is is that drought-tolerant plants don't need to be watered. So this is a, a common thought, like, you know, I'm growing these drought-tolerant plants. Whatever rain happens should be just fine. And eventually, yes, they should be just fine with the rain that you get. Um, however, you want to make sure that you are growing the right plant for your zone. But also, um, they do need water, like, the first year. So you want to make sure because it, it gives them a chance to get established. So when you plant a new drought tolerant plant, you want to make sure that they are getting water to get their roots established, to get established into the earth. Um, and that gives them some kind of a training wheels for those tough plants. Once they're year old, they can pretty much fend for themselves. And then you do want to give them some a layer of mulch the first year as well. You can continue to mulch year after year, especially if it's something like a perennial that you put in a bed to just be and you want the mulch there to look pretty and nice. You can add more mulch as time goes on, but the first year you should definitely give them mulch. See, when I hear about drought tolerant plants, I... I you know, people, uh, you go to the garden center and you see the little tag, oh, drought on. It's not like you're going to the desert in New Mexico or Arizona or wherever and you see the cacti and you see all of these plants that are growing that get minimal or no rain for months and months on end. 
this is a totally different type of situation right? So these than, are... than plants that have been adapted in that particular environment, even if you're buying it from the garden center and it's supposed to be a plant that is like that. Right. So these are things like yarrow, um, Russian sage, cor- coneflower. Those are common drought tolerant plants. There's probably, I mean, there's more, but these are the ones that are their actual plants are not just like cacti or, or succulents. Well, we see that in tomatoes and vegetables. There are more to- uh, drought tolerable, not drought tolerant. They do need they can they can sustain themselves a little bit better when it's cold when it's hot and dry than the traditional tomato or pepper or eggplant. But it doesn't mean it's good for seventeen weeks without any water and one hundred and five degrees. Right. All right, next one, Holly. Um, So gravel in the bottom of a container to help drainage. This is the thought that you put, like, whether it be gravel, rocks, um, styrofoam, packing peanuts, aluminum cans, just random stuff. And basically, it it doesn't, it actually can prevent the water from draining out as easily. I mean, obviously, if you put cans, (laughs) you're just filling space, but... Adding anything extra like gravel or something that is um, even possibly less porous than soil is just going to prevent the water to drain out. It could possibly cause root rot for certain plants. So you can just, a drainage hole is enough. You don't need to add more items for the drainage. Drainage hole is just fine. The next one is dish soap is a natural, safe alternative to pesticides. I think some people get confused. There is insecticidal soap and it that can damage the plants um if you use too much and then dish soap can also kind of damage the plants because it is a man-made detergent and it's um chemical you know chemical cleaner sometimes degreaser so if you're using your like regular dish soap to use an incesticide that does not work now you can use like a natural dish soap sometimes to help apply things like neem oil, but you're not using a lot. It's to the adherence. It's the glue that yeah. holds it onto the plant for the application to be functional. Right. So what you want to do is you want to use um, you want to use insecticidal soap. They are made to be used on plants to kill or repel insects without harming the plants. And those are regulated by the EPA. So there is science behind them. Your regular run of the mill, just dish soap is not something that is, you know, monitored by the EPA for plant usage. Uh, on a side note on that, <clears throat> if it says organic, it doesn't mean it's necessarily safer. It is less toxic and less potent than the chemical alternative. So in a sin, it, it, it in, in, basically it it will work. It's not as strong, meaning it's not as damaging to the environment, but it's still a chemical, even though it's labeled organic. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Deer resistant plants on the edge of your yard will keep the deer out. Incorrect. Incorrect. So deer, you know, they're not, I guess. Um, well, Michigan State University Extension uh, put this uh, put this to test. Yeah. So deer are not, um, you know, food stupid. They know how to find food. So just because you put, you know, your rosemary, um, ferns, anything, uh, I think there's like a Mexican sunflower. Yes. Um, that they're, they're, you know, they're going to be like, oh, you know, I don't like. Well, we got to go somewhere else. We got to go somewhere else. They've blocked us out. It's kind of like thinking that your hungry teenager isn't going to eat your cookies if you put the kale in front of them. You just reach around the kale to get the cookies. Um, so yeah, so you, the most effective way is to use something like, um, deer defeat. Deer defeat or a fence. Deer defeat is an, uh, uh, all natural. Spray that you apply on your plants that will dry in 30 minutes and last for uh, over 30 days uh, through rain, snow, and sleet. And it doesn't have, it only smells for the first 30 minutes to humans, but it is still potent to a level which animals can uh, pick it up deer, rabbit, and groundhog for a duration of time. Uh, you can use coupon code radio 
to save 10% on your order at DeerDefeat.com. And side note, all the coupon codes, if you're looking for a coupon code on the sponsors in which you have heard on the program, you can go to our parent website, The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, and click on the Money tab at the top of the page, and they're all listed for you. Yes, so deer defeat offense, those are basically the guarantee you can plant the stuff, you can try, but deer aren't, they're not dumb. They know how to get their resources. Deer can jump. White tailed deer now. I'm not familiar with mule deer or black tailed deer. White tailed deer can jump as high as eight feet from a standing start and up to 12 feet high with a running start. So it all also depends on how the food situation is in your area. Is there abundance of food? Or is your garden uh, next to a wooded area? Is it in the open? Is there a lot of vegetation around your neighborhood or your your country, your your rural your your rural area? Uh, <clears throat> if there is not then there is more of a invitation that you're presenting for the deer to come in because they are not finding it anywhere else. So the deer defeat will, it doesn't repel them, it prevents them from consuming the plants in which you're trying to grow. So let's keep that clear. It's not a fence, you know, it's not a, oh, oh you can't come in. They're going to wander through, but they're not going to consume the plants because you've applied the deer defeat. So keep that all in mind on what's around, what's available, and that might also be what's causing them to come in. A very uh, a rainy year, a lot of, lot of vegetation, probably not going to have much. Uh, very drought-stricken uh, year, your garden looks very lush. Hey, it's a, you know, things are going to come over and not only just deer, but rabbit, squirrel, anything else uh, to want to consume what you have grown. If fertilizer is good, then, well, more is better. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's like, it's almost like, um, you know, this, this, uh, Italian seasoning mix is really good. So I definitely need to load it on. Yes and no, but not, not for fertilizer. So too much fertilizer can create high soluble salt levels that can burn the roots of plants and lead to plant decline. It, it's kind of like, and, and Holly are not, and Holly and I are not alcohol consumers, but it's kind of like you see this on TV. Uh, if, if one beer is good, well, two must be better. And if two is better, four must be even better. You can get, you know, there's a level that you've crossed a line somewhere. And too much is not good. Right. Too much fun is not good either. That's dangerous as well. That's dangerous as well, yes. So, um, yeah. So too much fertilizer can create um, this problem that can cause root rot, it can cause plant decline, and... Adding fertilizer into a struggling garden garden will have little effect. So things like, um, you know, making sure that you have drainage, your soil is healthy. Do you have a good base before you start yeah, adding fertilizer? Exactly. Most plants can get what they need from the soil as long as you keep adding compost and feeding the soil and replenishing the soil, adding leaves, etc. Now, we're not saying that fertilizer is bad. There is organic fertilizer, which is safer and better for your garden than a chemical based or a chemical liquid base that allows the plants to become uh, become addicted or dependent on it so uh, your mileage may vary but if you start with a good foundation good soil you can add fertilizer but add it according to the recommended rate because otherwise you're just wasting it wasting it well what people are not wasting is their time when they go to waltonsinc.com to get their spices, seasonings, and butchering equipment. Yeah, we were brought to you today by our sponsor, Walton's Inc. We know you care about where your food comes from. Canning, preserving your fruits and vegetables is great, but what about the meat? At Walton's Inc., you can get the equipment, seasoning, and supplies to make sausage, jerky, and any other meat products your way to your high standards. Do you want to make snack sticks that people will actually like? Walton's created MeatJustSticks.com, an informational site to help you make the best finished product. Walton's even has a full line of their own meat grinders, mixers, and sausage stuffers to help you go from animal to edible. Walton's everything but the meat. You can use code GROW50, that's GROW50, to save 10% off your orders of $50 or more. And when we return, food storage without canning. You're tuned in to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. 
Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Garden like a pro in three easy steps and receive customized fertilizer recommendations for your garden or lawn. Soil Savvy helps you determine what nutrients your plants need to thrive. Never again overapply nutrients they don't need. A patented process that makes you a smart gardener. To get your soil test kit, go to MySoilSavvy.com. Wisconsin Greenhouse Company has custom-made greenhouses to suit your needs. Grow year-round. Strongest greenhouses that will last a lifetime. From agricultural to lounging to entertaining. For more information, go to WisconsinGreenhouseCompany.com. Happy 65th anniversary to David J. Frank, Southeastern Wisconsin's leading landscape company. Their award-winning services include everything from lawn care, landscape maintenance, design, construction, renovation, irrigation, sustainability, and more. Big or small, let the experts at David J. Frank handle the hard work for you. Find out more at davidjfrank.com. Deer Defeat is an all-natural based animal repellent to keep deer and rabbits away from your valuable plants that is odorless after 30 minutes and dries clear. It creates a continuous invisible shield to protect your plants works for 30 days through rain snow and freeze will not clog your sprayer apply to your property without environmental damage you can spray directly onto your plants up to flowering then apply around your plants to continue protection no need to reapply money back guarantee to purchase go to deerdefeat.com and use coupon code radio to save 10 percent off your order Make hand watering easy and enjoyable with hose link retractable hose reels. No more tripping over hoses, kinks, tangles, and avoiding rolling the hose up. With an automatic retractable hose link saves you time and effort manually coiling up your hose, leaving your focus on the things that will bring you joy in your garden. Available in multiple colors and lengths, you'll be sure to find the retractable hose that works for you. To find out more and to buy online via hoselink.com, use coupon code RADIO10 for $10 discount. Count. Mantis tillers, the premium long-lasting gas-powered tillers, are the perfect solution for any garden. This Mantis machine is available with two or four cycle engines with a 19-inch or 16-inch tilling width. Your DIY companion in your garden and your lawn converts easily for edging, aerating, and more with optional attachments. Find details at mantis.com. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you so much for allowing us to be part of your day-to-day Moments away, we're going to discuss food storage without canning. But first, a word from our bee-friendly friends at Honey Bee Healthy. Since 2000, Honey Bee Healthy Inc. has helped beekeepers maintain healthy and thriving hives. Attracting pollinators to your garden this year is as simple as hanging a hummingbird feeder with a mixture of sugar water and Honey Bee Healthy Original. Don't be alarmed to see birds, bees, and butterflies dying together at the feeder. Pollinators coexist peacefully. Honey Bee Healthy Inc. is offering a 10% discount on an eight ounce bottle of honey be healthy original to this show's listeners enter discount code b garden that's b e e garden at checkout for more information mixing instructions you can go to honeybehealthy.com and you can do that year round you birds eat year round uh so and bees as well so keep that in mind and coupon codes all at the wisconsin vegetable gardener.com under the money tab at the top of the page so harvest, you're harvesting out of your garden. You got a, a plethora of uh, different items. And some of you, and there's nothing wrong with this, some of you choose not to water bath or pressure can your produce. Nothing wrong with that. Those who do pressure can and water bath your canning, your, your produce, uh, you may want to look at other avenues as we're going to discuss. But real quick for an, uh, uh, educational purposes, so everybody understands, uh, we're not going to get into water bath and or pressure canning, but what is the difference and what are the criteria that each one of those represent uh, and and possibly why people may want to choose an alternate method of storing their produce, Holly? Sure. So water bath canning is for high acid foods like fruit. Fruit is commonly high acid. Or if you're adding an acid or sugar to a fruit or vegetable. So, for example, like pickled beets, uh, dilly beans, salsa, pasta corn, corn sauce, salsa. corn salsa. You're adding acid, vinegar, sugar, et cetera, to those items. Making it safe. Making it safe. So you, it's, um, that's what water bath canning is. And then pressure canning is for the more low acid foods and then meats. So those are when you want to can like carrots or, um, potatoes, potatoes, 
just regular corn, regular beans, etc. Salmon, uh, venison, beef. So, okay. So there is some alternative. I mean, what would be a reason why somebody would choose that? Hey, I don't. I really don't want to can. There, there, Maybe there's they don't reasons. want to do the whole process. Maybe they don't want to. They have, you know, they have plenty of freezer space. They just don't want to deal with canning. They would rather just and nothing wrong with this. Yeah, nothing wrong with this. Yeah. So the first one is this freezing. So a lot of times you'll see recipes for like freezer jam. That's an option. Also freezing and blanching your vegetables. We do this with our green beans. Blanching or parboiling um, is when you kind of boil the vegetables for about a minute and then put them into a cold water shock bath. And this helps maintain their um, integrity, integrity shape. I don't know what you want to say so that when you pull it out of the freezer, it's not like vegetable mush unless you're into that. So, for example, like if you froze broccoli as is without blanching it, it would become broccoli mush after you pull it out of the freezer. It's like when you freeze a tomato and then pull it out of the freezer, it just flattens. Yeah. Yeah. Now, some people do choose to freeze their tomatoes that way, and then they choose to can them or just make a sauce like on the, you know, randomly and make the sauce that day. Right. And they'll, they'll freeze the tomatoes in, and then can in the winter so they're not heating their house in the summer. Yes. They've got a system down. Yeah. Uh, so, but freezing, uh, what what is freezer jam? I, you know, freezer jam is just basically jam made um, to be frozen. And a lot of times you don't have to use pectin. You can just kind of cook down the fruit with some sugar and then you freeze it and then, it, you know, you freeze Whatever. it for storage, but whenever yeah. you want to use it, you remove it and put it in the fridge and use it in a timely manner. Otherwise, it will spoil. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so then we have cold storage. cold storage or root cellar. So I don't know much about root cellars. Root cellars are uh, basically, from what I understand, and somebody can correct me at GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com, uh, root cellars are basically small basements underneath old homes. Um, and then there's, um, what is it, cisterns? That where the water collects off the roof into a, a basin in the basement, and that is used to, uh, to uh, for the water of the house. It, it, it's very old, but very creative way of utilizing. So basically, a, 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 a root cellar is okay. A root cellar is also somebody modern days may take and dig an underground uh, ca- chamber. And line it with car uh, with uh, concrete, or like um, for people who are not familiar, like a tornado shelter in the in the south in Texas and in Oklahoma, where it's a stairway underground and it's five or ten feet underground. And you can store all of your stuff. It's got shelving. There's old pictures online of these root cellars that are packed to the brim of canned goods and pumpkins and all the and and pears and apples. It's what it's a technique in which the majority of society has either never heard of or have uh, forgotten about. There you go. So you can, mimic, you can do it. You can do it in a basement. Yeah, you can mimic this by a basement, maybe an attic. Unclimatized basement. Unclimatized basement, unclimatized attic. Well, the attic, the issue with the attic is... Uh, it could you, get really hot. You've got to figure out when you can go up and put it. Otherwise, yeah, it will turn into a sauna and not good but an unclimatized basement in a corner you can shelve uh, and put a lot of stuff um, but just because you put a pumpkin or squash or apples or pears in the basement in an unclimatized area where it is a consistent fill in the blank 45 degrees and lower humidity you it, it's there's still spoilage that happens and you've got to be aware yeah. of that with the conditions that are down there and the 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 requirements in which to have the proper humidity or adding a dehumidifier to get that humidity to a specific level in order for best longevity of this produce in which you're putting down there. Not the canning jars, but the uh, squashes and the pumpkins and apples and pears and those type of items. Right. So, um, yeah, so that's the, the root cellar, cold storage. Basement. Basement, whatever you want to call it. Now, fridge storage, this is another thing, too. A lot of people will store their root vegetables, especially in their fridge. And when you do that, you can 
what I would recommend is not cleaning them off. Just whatever is dirt on them, leave them on there. Cabbage lasts a long time. Beets last a long time. Uh, carrots. carrots last a long time. Yes. Yes. So these are things that you don't necessarily need to can. You can put them in your fridge and they will last for quite some time. Now with um, carrots you and beets, you can take like a, a, a wooden box and layer sand and put the sand uh, around each item, and that's a longevity method. Real, real quick, back to the, um, w- w- the 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 storage in the root cellar, the base, the basement storage. We see, and, and many of you are, are familiar, that you see this online. You know the the preppers, and there's nothing wrong to, for being prepared. Our grandparents, this was life. You know, we got to prepare for the because there wasn't a. I want a pineapple on Christmas Day. Let's just go down to the big box store and pick up a pineapple. It was preparation, storage, plan the next seed. We see we you read these things about oh you know so and so on this post you know got all these hundreds of canning jars and they're on shelves and they're real pretty and you'll see comments underneath well they're ready for a natural disaster way to go be aware of where you put your canning jars yeah on a shelf because a natural disaster could be an earthquake and when an earthquake shakes a shelf and there's no guardrail on that shelf what's on the shelf goes to the floor and all those cans that fall or glass and you're going to kind of have all that preparation on the floor and you're not going to have anything when that disaster happens you can just put them on shelves and you put a little railing around it to k- keep them from vibrating off during something like an earthquake continue okay so yeah um the food storage um another one would be uh, vacuum pack seal. Now, this is something that you may actually have to freeze. I don't know a ton about vacuum packing, but some people will also freeze dry items, which as I know is a different method than just dehydrating. Oh, that's what I was going with was dehydrating. And then there's freeze drying. So both of those will help your food because you're removing that moisture. In and different you, methods. Yep. And then when you vacuum pack it, it removes the air. So this can make things stable. I know a lot of like people who do backpacking will do this. They'll cook the food, they'll dehydrate it, and then they'll vacuum seal it. And then it makes it nice and light. And when they're on the trail, they can reconstitute it with water. And then it becomes whatever it was. So like chili or some sort of rice dish or pasta, etc. So that is another option is freeze drying or dehydrating and then vacuum packing it. Uh, dehydrating, <clears throat> you're introducing a heat in order to remove the moisture from the item. Freeze drying uh, is a process that removes water from the material by turning it into an ice to vaporizing a vapor from ice to vapor without going through a liquid state. The process is also used to preserve perishable materials such as food uh, and extend its shelf life by decades. So it's a different method. It's a much longer shelf life than a dehydrated method, Uh, but also in order to freeze dry, there is a specific uh, item or unit in which has to be purchased that can be much, much more, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Uh, so that's just something if you're not aware of freeze drying. You can buy freeze dried items in uh, the big box stores, like candies and, and fruits, but they are quite pricey uh, for a very small quantity. Correct. All right. Do we have any more there? Um, just sometimes people will pack things like garlic and oil. I don't know how long that shelf stable is for, but the thought is, is that you're packing in oil and then it kind of, um, the fat in the oil helps it become more shelf stable and prevents air from getting to it. Yeah. So that's an option as well. And then another one is just keeping in mind that a lot of these vegetables, like example for garlic, you want to keep it in a cool, dry place and out of direct sunlight and it's going to last longer. In that case, um, our garlic has lasted us like six to nine months. eight months. Yeah, six to nine months. So that's an option, a thought as well, is that if you do need to keep something, then you, you can't keep it in the fridge. Keeping it away from direct sunlight or heat source is going to make it last longer than if it's in you know, a heat source. Well, summer is getting close to being over, Holly, and the kids are now back in school. And in some parts of the country, the nights are getting colder and longer. However, you have maybe have forgotten about your yard, and you should not have. 
Just because it's fall, we don't want to forget about our yards and those Japanese beetles either. They may be gone, but they're not far. Not only did they feast on your roses and berries this summer, they laid eggs in your turf so you can start again next year. Take a stand with Phylum's Grub Gone. Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT product that um, actually specifically targets scarab pests and their larvae. Simply apply the granule with a spreader, irrigate into the soil, and let the naturally occurring bacteria do its job. Not only does Grub Gone work and it's easy to use but it's non-chemical choice and effective to uh, the non-chemical choice to effectively control those grubs the best part about it it is non-toxic to bees and other beneficial pollinators and insects such as ladybugs and butterflies in fact grub gone has no label restrictions to be used around flowering plants so you don't have to worry about harming those insects you can find all this out at grubgone.com from the parent company phylum bioproducts the natural choice well hang out with us when we return jessica mccullen will be with us youtuber you're tuned in to the garden with joy and holly radio show have a garden question give joey and holly a call now or anytime 24 7 just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. Take the guesswork out of composting with the Aerobin 400 or smaller 200 for easy composting. The Aerobin mimics how nature decomposes waste. The Aerobin is easy to use. You prepare your balanced organic waste. Just open it up, drop it in, and close. After a short time, fertile compost is produced, which is easily accessed via the lower side door. The thermal insulation in the aerobin conserves heat, leading to rapid breakdown of the biomass and works efficiently year-round, even in cooler regions. There is no need to turn the biomass and it is pet and rodent resistant. It has little odor and can kill annoying weeds and seeds. It is BPA-free. The Aerobin 400 or 200 comes with a reservoir at the bottom to collect the leachate when diluted makes for great compost tea liquid fertilizer. Aerobin composts kitchen and garden waste quickly. Easy to assemble with no special tools needed. The Aerobin makes composting rewarding and easy. Go to burpee.com or homedepot.com to purchase. Protect your plants from damage with the 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. Use promo code RADIO10 to save 10% off your order. Are you ready to take control of your home's comfort? With Mr. Cool DIY Direct, empower yourself with our top-notch do-it-yourself cooling and heating solution. Introducing the Mr. Cool 4th Generation Mini Split, the DIY-friendly way to keep your home perfectly comfortable all year round. Our systems come with everything you need for installation, including our patented pre-charge line sets, eliminating the need for expensive professional help. Visit MrCoolDIYDirect.com to learn more and to take the first step towards a cooler, more comfortable home. Don't forget, use promo code GARDEN for a special discount and free nationwide shipping. Mr. Cool DIY Direct. Cool your house, heat your space, all by yourself. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Rootmaker starts your plants off right and keeps them going through harvest. From their seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots to their large variety of grow bags, 1 to 60 gallons. Their products will provide you the harvest you've never seen before. Visit rootmaker.com. Use coupon code ROOT24 to save 15% off your order at rootmaker.com. That coupon code is ROOT24 to save 15% off your order at rootmaker.com. If you could double the life of your raised bed boxes by sealing the wood with a clear non-toxic wood preservative, would you? Well, now you can with a clear penetrating product called internal wood stabilizer. It's 100% non-toxic and easy to apply. Seal your untreated wood surfaces, even chicken coops, by spraying on internal wood stabilizer. It's invisible, seals the wood from the inside out, and never wears off. Recommended by organic gardening experts, internal wood stabilizer. Check it out at TimberProCoatingsUSA.com. Wind River Chimes will always be the inspiring harmony. With a large selection of customization options, you will find the sound that soothes you. Visit WindRiverChimes.com to shop and find out more. Welcome back to the 
Garden with Joey and Holly Radio Show. Happy that you've chose us to spend a little time with. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Jessica McCullum enjoys teaching new gardeners how to get started and encourages their garden journey. She does this on her YouTube channel called From Dream to Seed. Welcome to the program, Jessica. Hello. Thanks for having me. Well, we thank you for taking time out of your day and about to educate Holly and myself and all of our listeners. And I'll start with this. We all have visions and focuses on on what we do. What is your focus for beginner gardeners? What do you hope to get there? What was the message you want them to receive? I wanted to break down gardening in a way that was easier to to understand. I feel like sometimes when you get into gardening, it can just be overwhelming. There's so much sort of not conflicting information, but just different information that works for different people. I just sometimes I feel like you know, you just got to get the seed in the ground. And that's kind of where the the name of my channel comes from. So I wanted to break it down in a way that was more accessible, that wasn't so overwhelming to the brand new beginner gardener. And and we see this and you're in the same kind of the same field that we are. When people jump in to say, hey, I want to start a garden to it may be easier for them just to take an engine apart in the parking lot than to try to figure out how to plant and what to plant and who to believe and who not to believe. Exactly. So what is a common problem beginner gardeners have and how do you help help them with it? I, the two, actually two most common I see, the two are kind of biting off more than you can chew. And, and I totally get this and I, and I completely did this as a brand new gardener. You get so excited. So you plant out this huge garden with everything you want to grow and it just gets so overwhelming. So I always tell beginners, pick like four or five things that you, you, that you really love that you know, you're going to eat and, or, or use if it's a cut flower and start there and then slowly add on one or two new things every year. So you don't come this time of year when the weeds are growing and you're kind of burnt out of gardening. It just doesn't get overwhelming. And the second problem is not putting enough time and energy into the soil. And that's something I really, really try to hone in on um, on my channel is to really put the effort into the soil, not the plants. And, and that's the thing. People, oh, fertilizer, fertilizer, let's feed the plant. Mm-hmm. No, you got to feed the soil to feed the plant. And that's what big ag industry does. They feed the plant. The soil is just a medium for the plant to grow in. We're trying to have a sustainable system here, not something that we keep pumping chemicals in in order to get something to grow. Yeah, definitely. So you have a YouTube channel, and it's you have... Um, you have a lot of information there. Can you tell us about your YouTube channel, what people can expect and what it's all about? Yeah, you know, that's where I originally started, other than I had a small kind of Facebook page as well. And this initially started, um, I, I became a master gardener in 2020. And that same year, you know, we had this big thing going on in the world. And so many people were wanting to garden either just for something to do or because they were worried. Um, you know, we weren't quite sure where this, th- that path was going to go. And so I, I was kind of getting overwhelmed with questions from friends and family and neighbors because they knew I was a master gardener. So I originally just decided to do a beginner gardener series on YouTube. I was going to just create nine or 10 videos to get people started and just be like, here, you can watch this. But it kind of just evolved into this thing that I really enjoyed. It was my creative outlet. I was happy to share and it expanded from YouTube to other social medias. And so the main thing on my YouTube channel, um, as far as my beginner gardener series, which was the original content that I, that I put out there was again, just literally starting from the beginning. What kind of garden should I have? What direction should my garden face? How do I build up soil? How do I put a seed in the ground? Really breaking things down for beginner gardeners. And that's not a bad thing for advanced gardeners to go back and revisit because information has changed. Different thought processes have changed because when they got started, they may have seen somebody or read something and that was just what they went with. And now we have, you know, oh, well, I can take a little bit of from that and that and that and make my own creation in my backyard now and redo what I've done. Oh, for sure. And I feel like even even I've been gardening for 50, over 15 years now, and I feel like I, I still 
every year. <laughs> I feel like I always tell people that gardening is like raising kids. Every time you think you got it figured out, they throw you a curveball. <laughs> so it just, um, you know, you never stop learning. And gardening is a science. And best practices change all the time. And we're constantly learning new things. Um, so, yeah, you're never, ever, I don't think you can ever quite master gardening. There's always something new to learn. Now, do you find or advise a new gardener to strictly go in the ground or strictly containers or raise beds, or is it your mileage may vary, so you need to figure it out for your own self? Uh, absolutely. I tell gardeners that each garden is unique as the gardener planting it. So it really, the goal of my channel is to give people options because, there are some hard, fast rules in gardening, but other things are, it just kind of depends on so much, your climate, your soil, your accessibility, the size of your yard, you know, so what you want to grow. So I don't think there's a one size. In fact, I know there's not a one size fits all garden and you can garden in so many different ways and do it successfully. There's a, there's thousands of ways to grow a tomato, right? Right. So I, I, my, the goal of my channel is to give people options and then they can kind of cherry pick what, what what's going to work best for them. Uh, I would always advise, and, and you correct me, uh, if you're going in the ground, do a soil test to know if the soil is good, if there's toxicity, if you shouldn't grow in the gar- ground and go in a, an elevated system. Uh, I am a huge, huge proponent of soil testing, especially for the home gardener, mainly because I tell people it it stops you from adding things to the soil that it doesn't need. And over fertilizing, especially with things like phosphorus, are so bad for our waterways and um, can really, really cause a lot of trouble. Well, it ain't Um, cheap either. If you're why add more stuff and spend more money than you don't have. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's. You know, and if you're going to grow a specialty crop, say like a blueberry, then you're, you're going to need to know, you know, you can't expect to stick certain plants in the ground and expect them to thrive. So I'm a huge proponent of soil testing. I think it really is just a wealth of knowledge. It is intimidating for beginner gardeners, and I completely understand that. And it's not hugely accessible to everyone, um, but there are ways to get it to do it. And, you know, and I think it's I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan of soil testing. It just tells you so much. Well worth the money to, to know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Agree. With with all of your journeys here and starting, I, we, I'm sure you've made a big oopsie or a big mistake. Is there anything that stands out that you go, well, I should have known not to do that, but I'll use that as a learning uh, tip for everybody who's watching so they don't make the same mistake I did? <laughs> I tell people if I know how to grow something, it's because I killed it the first five or six times. <laughs> <laughs> so I, And I think we all just kind of learn. Um, I think... The consistent thing that I still do to this day, I'm, I'm much better at it. Um, I tend to, well, the biggest thing I used to do was I would put my seedlings out too early. We, Where I live, they always say it was Derby Day. I live near um, in the Ohio Valley. So everyone would say, oh, Derby Day, Derby Day. And then when I became a master gardener and they were like, no, it's actually a week later. And I was like, oh, it's fine, it's fine. And I lost so many of my seedlings one year because we had a late frost and I continued to just oh it'll be fine it'll be fine so it took me a good three years to finally be like okay I I just need to wait and stop like you know these stop ruining my seedlings I've spent weeks on um I think now it's just mainly you know there's just certain plants you really have to stay on top of and because I'm an organic gardener there's just certain pests I need to kind of stay on top of. I usually do hand picking or I'm um, doing row covers and things like that. But, you know, life just gets busy. I've right. got three kids and <laughs> they keep me on my toes. So I don't know if it's a mistake. It's just mainly sometimes just letting things get away from me. It's just the reality of life. The reality yeah. of life. Yeah. Yeah. So what is the best or most memorable advice you got as a beginner gardener? I would say what I'm teaching now and that's to feed the soil not your plants that was something I when I went into my master gardener certification I was just a veggie gardener I I didn't realize that gardens are like an ecosystem and you know there's there's, it's it's living breathing kind of thing and so once I realized the importance of soil health and how to um, really feed that soil and help it to be a, a you know a living thriving kind of ecosystem in and of itself, it completely changed my garden. The, the, um, 
the health of my plants just skyrocketed after I really started putting time into composting, time into rotating my crops, time into adding organic matter. Um, just really, really made such a huge difference. So I would definitely say taking care of that soil, number one, most important thing in the garden. Absolutely. Well, we uh, really appreciate the time you've offered us here and uh, educating Holly and myself and all of our listeners. How can people find out more about you? How can they find your channel and uh, where are you located on the World Wide Web? I am on YouTube. I am on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and TikTok under my handle from Dream to Seed. And that's pretty much where you can find me. Absolutely. Well, we greatly appreciate the time you've ha- you've offered us and the information you've shared. We thank you very much for that. Thank you. I loved being here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And when we return, it's your garden questions and our garden answers. You're tuned in to the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Are you bugged by bugs? You need naturally green products, No More Bugs, environmentally friendly. Made in the USA, No More Bugs is a cedar blend that repels and eliminates mosquitoes, noceums, ticks, fleas, roaches, ants, and more. No More Bugs is safe for you, your pets, and plants. Available online at nomorebugs.net. Amazon, Walmart.com, and the Home Shopping Network. Jung Seed Company is a family-owned and operated seed company since 1907 with the largest selection of seeds and plants online. Use coupon code 10TG24 to save 10% off your order at JungSeed.com. The coupon code is 10TG24 at JungSeed.com for 10% off. Your mosquito frustrations are over. Now with Mega Catch, suitable for residential and commercial use. Mega Catch mosquito traps produce a vast array of mosquito attracted stimuli, including safe CO2, and can attract mosquitoes and other biting insects up to 150 feet away. Easy to use and set up. The Mega Catch is ready to make your outdoor space comfortable and enjoyable at megacatch.com. Use coupon code J O E Y B, my name, Joey B, at checkout and receive 20% discount on your entire trap order at megacatch.com. Garden like a pro in three easy steps and receive customized fertilizer recommendations for your garden or lawn. Soil Savvy helps you determine what nutrients your plants need to thrive. Never again overapply nutrients they don't need. A patented process that makes you a smart gardener. To get your soil test kit, go to MySoilSavvy.com. Soil Diva Liquid Microbe Stimulant Spray improves the health of your plants you work hard to grow, stimulates the natural enzymes, and increases beneficial soil bacteria. Go to SoilDiva.net. SoilDiva.net. Water supply tanks provide BPA-free, long-term, safe storage for drinking water from 35 to 1,500-gallon tanks. Water supply tanks has you covered from preparing for unexpected needs, off-grid property, easy gardening access, and more. For questions and to order, visit watersupplytanks.com and use coupon code GARDENING10 to save 10% off your order. Welcome back to the Garden with Joey and Holly Radio Show. Time for your garden questions and our garden answers. Thank you for being with us today. If you've got a question, you can send it on over to Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com. That's Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com, and we will get an answer to your question. You can also give us a call toll free, coast to coast at 1 800 927 show. That's 1 800 927 7469. All right, I have a basil plant that is planted, and I have harvested a good bit of basil from it this year, but was wanting to see if it would get any bigger than it has been. Would it hurt if I filled the planter up around dirt around and covered the stem near the bottom of the plant like people do with tomatoes when they plant them? Um, so this really wouldn't work because typically at this point in the season, the soft tissue has become like a hard woody, uh, stem at the bottom. And so roots would not form. Um, so that would, wouldn't allow for them to, to, you know, form more more more, like a tree trunk versus a soft tissue plant. And yeah, so it's like whenever you you can cause, uh, mildew and rot. 
Right. So, but you can next season, if you grow more basil and you start the seeds and the plants are a little leggy, which means like their stem is a little bit long, you can plant them um, up to the first set of leaves. Yeah. So uh, don't you can eat now. You can, if you are beginning to see the roots erosion of uh, soil away from the roots, you can add a little bit there, but there's no need to uh, put it around the stem. Get as much off the plant as possible and enjoy that basil that you have grown. Next question here, Holly. I have potato scab. I've had potato scab for a few years now. I know it's not harmful to eat uh, the potatoes. I just peel them and um, it, the potatoes are fine. My question is, how can I prevent it from happening again in the first place? First of all, what is, what is potato scab? All right. So to, to help potato scab or to remedy potato scab is making sure that you buy um, your if you buy potato seeds seed potatoes, seed for the potatoes. purpose of planting them, not just store bought yeah. potatoes. Um, make sure you do trust your your uh, p- supplier, and I would speak with them if you bought these potatoes from a supplier. Speak with them about the scab because, because if you have it, other people have had it because that's where this, it's coming from a certain most a certain source a direct right. location yeah if you have slightly acidic soil it will help prevent potato scab so i would just this is what i would do is i would make sure that the supplier wherever i got them from is aware of the problem and then i would just plant the potato somewhere else next season right you don't want to plant uh preferably uh not in the same spot more than one season ideally uh, plant them where legumes have grown the year before peas or beans as they will have added much uh, more nutrients to the soil. Avoid planting them where other members, uh, other plants like tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants and potatoes have grown as pests and disease tend to infect uh, that family of plants. So uh, peat moss, a light uh, peat moss is a is a light draining material that you can add to your uh, planting. You can also touch the uh, dust them with sulfur. That kind of actually helps if you're doing divisions of potatoes. Uh, you can put them in a bag, shake them up, and and uh, do it that way as well. So there's a number of ways in which, um, if it is a bothersome to you, to deal with the potato scab. But again, if you and we if if you're having it, you just peel it off. Uh, it's not going to hurt you. And we've actually seen potato scab in commer- in in grocery stores as well in um, yeah, bags. It, it was uh, I think it was just like an issue for a long time in the grocery store because it. And we, I've seen it even yet uh, recently. Yeah. So, any thoughts or advice on potentially or potentially up or down on dumping all the soil peat moss compost that I have in numerous five gallon plastic containers, canvas bags, pots, etc. into one big pile that I can solar heat to kill the fungus or and other bad stuff that might be present. Then compost it in the pile and amend it in my garden next year. So that is perfectly fine. If you feel that you have had issues, plants with disease in these containers, grow bags, ray, uh, grow bags, uh, terracotta pots, whatever the case is, five gallon buckets. If you have not had issues with the soil or the plants, then I would not worry about dumping them out. Now you, solarization is a method in which you cover it with a black plastic and it basically bakes the soil at, at a high temperature solarizing it underneath and uh, you can also yeah black I think is the best you can do it with white or clear but that's not really the best because it's you want no light and it will kill all the the viable seeds most diseases it should kill basically you're, you're creating a very intense compost pile beneath this but back to my initial uh, evaluation of if there was no issue with the soil in these containers, and these are containers of five gallons or more like the buckets, you don't need to dump the soil out and get new soil next year. If the soil was fine, you can remove 
a third of the soil in the container, the five-gallon bucket, the terracotta pot, and then top it with new compost next year. If you have containers that are one, two, three-gallon grow bags or pots, then the soil uh, mass is so small that it is recommended to dump out and start with fresh soil. If you've got containers that are 10, 15, 30, 50, 60 gallons, you really don't have to do anything to that soil unless there was problems. There's a lot of nutrient in that soil for the plants to grow. In those situations, you do have the uh, a, a problem of the soil nutrient leaching out when raining or watering. So supplementing with a fertilizer, organic, or if you choose an inorganic, that's your business, but that is important to add to as well as adding more compost in the container through the growing season to allow fresh material to work itself through that device or that unit of soil. Maybe that answers it. Maybe we got too deep in that. I don't know. Uh, but I think I think we've addressed some situations there with people, not, not, in addition to this listener, that uh, are facing some similar problems or questions. I have a couple of I have a couple of cabbages planted in an elevated raised bed, and I want to do more fall gardening in the ground. I will be getting rid of the elevated bed. Do you think I can successively transplant the current cabbage plants that are growing in the ground? Uh, they don't quite have heads on them yet. No. If they are a mature plant, yeah, you you're not going to... You can transplant them, but be, par- not gonna do well. but be prepared to rip them up about two weeks from now and throw them in the compost pile. Yeah, they're established. They're doing their thing. I would not transplant them. I would work around them as needed. And then once they're... Because at this point in the season, they're almost... If you've ever harvest. pulled any plant up at the end of the season, you can see the, the, the incredible root system if you have good soil. Uh, the fibrous roots and the the main growth root and all the offshoots of the roots, you damage any of those. It, everything is tied to that plant in some form or fashion. And if you start maneuvering and disrupting uh, those roots, the plant in the state of I'm putting on in this instance a cabbage head, you're going to cause it to shut down and, and pretty much die. It's right. just like trying to transplant a full-grown tomato plant that's bearing fruit into a different location. You will kill the plant. That's the end of the story. That's what's going to happen. So this is two lessons. One, don't move what is planted. Work around it. And two, if you are thinking about something of this nature of I have a, a certain place where things are growing, but I'm going to get rid of it next year – try to not plant in it or, you know, plant the whole bed full of cabbages. So whenever the cabbages are all done, then you can just discard that particular growing uh, method and be done with it. So we have come to the portion of the program, Holly, where we talk about what we learned today. And what I learned was that not all soap is created equal. Dish dish soap uh, is different than insecticidal soap, and both can have... Uh, by using the wrong kind of soap, you can cause uh, significant issues with your plants. So I learned that potato scab is a bacteria um, problem, bacteria infection, and also it affects um, gold. Is it gold potatoes? Um, yeah. Okay. So it affects the Yukon golds. More, which makes sense because those are what is common that we've seen on oh, red potatoes, and those are what we've seen at the grocery store. So yeah, we didn't mention yeah. that in the we we forgot to mention that in the actual yeah. description there. So what we learned today is brought to you by Honey Be Healthy. Honeybehealthy.com dot com is a series about the business of bees and helping beekeepers maintain healthy and thriving hives. Whether you're a professional beekeeper or a bee hobbyist, we've got the products to help you maintain a healthy hive. Honeybee Healthy products are made in the USA. Visit honeybehealthy.com. Tune into the program next week. We'll be going over and discussing good bugs you do want in your home. 
as well as preparing your garden for the first frost of the year. Our guest, she is the host of the Wicked Awesome Gardening YouTube channel, Daniel Martin, will be with us, and will answer your garden questions. So until next week for... Holly Baird. I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.